In this lecture, we are going to focus on monetary policy and the banking system. Monetary policy involves the use of changes in the money supply to contract or expand the economy. Between the Great Depression and the height of the Vietnam War, monetary policy largely played second fiddle to fiscal policy, and perhaps rightly so. After all, fiscal policy had been a resounding success in lifting us out of the Great Depression in the 1930s, as well as ending a more mild but nonetheless significant recession in 1949 and 1950. Moreover, the astonishing success of the Kennedy tax cut of 1964 seemed to provide incontrovertible proof that Keynesian economics could be used to fine-tune the economy and keep it at or close to full employment with minimal inflation. Nonetheless, even during these four decades of Keynesian triumphs, monetary policy played an important supporting role. Particularly in the 1950s, the Eisenhower administration relied heavily on a tight monetary policy to keep inflation in check. In fact, many critics now believe that an overly conservative monetary policy led to a stagnating economy in the late 1950s and set up the defeat of Eisenhower's would-be successor, Republican Richard Nixon, in the 1960 presidential election. Nixon, of course, lost to Democrat and Keynesian disciple John F. Kennedy, who ran on the slogan of getting the country moving again. Moving again was exactly what the Democratic administrations of first John F. Kennedy and then Lyndon Johnson did to the economy. In fact, by the end of the 1960s, the economy was moving so fast that inflation began to rear its ugly head. By 1969, inflation had crept to over 5%, high for those good old days, and by the early 1970s, it had jumped to almost double digits. It was at this point, as a new phenomenon known as stagflation began to emerge, that monetarism began to challenge the Keynesian orthodoxy. But we're getting ahead of our story. Let's go back to some basics, and let's start by defining money. So what is money? That's easy to answer, you might say. It's that cash in our pockets. But money actually has a much broader definition. It is anything that can be widely used and accepted in exchange for other goods and services. And in practice, there are three kinds of money. Commodity money, like gold nuggets and silver coins, represents the preferred money of centuries past. Today, however, in virtually all countries, commodity money has been replaced by two other kinds of money, bank money and paper or fiat money. An example of bank money is the checkbook that you use to pay your bills. So-called fiat money or paper money is simply the dollar bills in America, the euros in Europe, and the yen in Japan. An important observation to make about money is that it is the most liquid of assets, meaning that it is the most readily spendable. In fact, money has three major functions. First, money is a medium of exchange. Without money, we would have to conduct our transactions by barter, which involves the direct exchange of one good or service for another. Second, money serves as a unit of account or standard of value. It tells us the rates at which goods can be exchanged. For example, if a loaf of bread costs a dollar and a pound of butter costs two dollars, the butter will exchange for two loaves of bread. Third, money serves as a store of value. This is because people can hold on to money this year and then spend it next year. However, it is this function that money performs least well. This is because most methods of holding money do not yield the same kind of monetary returns that you could get by storing wealth in the form of other less liquid assets such as stocks and bonds. Thus, in the presence of inflation, money can rapidly lose its value. Now, when we examine how money affects economic activity, we will focus on the impact of the interest rate. This is actually something we've already talked a lot about, but haven't really yet defined. Technically, the interest rate is the amount of interest paid per unit of time expressed as a percentage of the amount borrowed. Put more simply, interest is simply the payment made for the use of money, and it is often called the price of money. 
For example, you might deposit $2,000 in a savings account at your local bank, where the rate of interest is 4% per year. At the end of the year, the bank will have paid $80 in interest into your account, so your deposit will be worth $2,080. Now, please also note this. Macroeconomic books often speak of the interest rate. But in fact, in today's complex financial system, there really is a vast array of interest rates, short-term rates and long-term rates, government bond rates and corporate bond rates, and so on. As to why interest rates differ across both time and the types of interest-bearing assets, there are three main reasons, all of which should be very intuitive. For example, one reason has to do with the term or maturity of the loan. This refers to the length of time until it must be paid off. This can range from overnight loans to up to 30 years for a home mortgage and everything in between. In general, longer-term loans command a higher interest rate because lenders are willing to sacrifice quick access to their funds only if they can increase their return or yield. A second reason why interest rates vary is the degree of risk. Some loans, such as the securities of the U.S. government, are virtually riskless. In fact, the interest rate on U.S. government securities is often called the riskless rate. In contrast, very risky investments, which bear a significant chance of default or non-payment, might include the securities of businesses close to bankruptcy, cities with shrinking tax bases, or countries like Argentina or Brazil with large overseas debt, and unstable political systems. These riskier investments might pay 1, 2, or even 5% or more per year above the rate of a very safe short-term U.S. government bond. Third, there is the issue of liquidity. An asset is said to be liquid if it can be converted into cash quickly with little loss of value. In contrast, because of the higher risk and difficulty of extracting a borrower's investment, Illiquid assets or loans usually command higher interest rates. Well, so far we've talked about the functions of money and the price of money. These discussions lead logically to a broader discussion of the demand for money. The two major determinants of money demand are known as the transactions demand and the asset demand. The transactions demand for money arises because people and firms use it as a medium of exchange. For example, households need money to buy groceries and businesses need money to pay for materials and labor. In contrast, the asset demand or speculative motive for holding money arises because people use money as a store of value. As an example of the asset demand for money, suppose you are interested in buying some stocks or bonds, but maybe you think that the present prices are too high. In this case, you might want to hold some money so that you can be ready to buy the stocks or bonds when the price becomes more attractive. Essentially, then, you are speculating that a better financial opportunity will appear soon. Note, however, that while money is an asset, money provides no rate of return or interest like other assets such as stocks and savings accounts do. Moreover, when you hold money, its value can depreciate because of inflation. So here's the punchline. There is an opportunity cost of holding money that includes the interest or rate of return that could have been earned by lending or investing the money, as well as the loss in value from holding money during inflation. So what do you think will happen to the asset demand for money if interest rates rise or the expectation of inflation increases? Well, if either the interest rate or the expectation of inflation increases, the opportunity cost of holding money increases as well. So the asset demand for money must decrease. Now that we know more about money, let's find out how money is created by the banking system. The best way to think about this is to go back several hundred years to England, where commodity money such as gold was the prevailing medium of exchange and goldsmiths emerged as the first commercial bankers. In this earlier era, people didn't like to carry around all that gold or leave it sitting around the house because it was cumbersome and might even get stolen. 
So people asked their goldsmiths to store it. The goldsmiths, in turn, would give the gold depositors a paper receipt, and when the depositor needed to get some gold to make a purchase, he or she would simply use that receipt to redeem the gold. Now, over time, three important things happened with this system. First, the depositors figured out that they could trade their gold receipts for goods, rather than go back to the goldsmith to redeem the paper every time they needed to make a transaction. These receipts functioned, in effect, as the first paper money. Second, the gold depositors soon figured out that they didn't have to leave their gold with the goldsmith for free. In fact, it wasn't long before goldsmiths began competing for depositors' gold. In those good old days, they didn't offer people free toasters and rebates to open an account, but they did offer them interest on their gold deposits. Finally, the goldsmiths figured out that they could operate under what is today called a system of fractional reserves. For example, they might take in $1,000 of gold deposits and issue receipts for that amount to the depositors. However, they then might turn around and also issue another $1,000 in gold receipts as loans to other people, even though they didn't have enough gold deposits to redeem all of the receipts that they issued. The goldsmiths could operate this way because it was highly unlikely that everybody who held the $2,000 of receipts would all come in at once to demand their gold. In this particular example, the implicit fractional reserve is 50% or 0.5. At this level, the goldsmiths would issue twice as many receipts as they had gold deposits for, and such a system allowed the goldsmiths to expand the supply of money over and above the amount of gold reserves they held in their vaults. Today's modern banks function much like the goldsmiths of old, and you can see now how such banks can create money. Suppose, for example, that a person deposits $1,000 in Bank 1. And suppose further that the bank's board of directors decide that they are going to maintain a fractional reserve or reserve requirement of 10%. This means that the board of directors is betting that no more than 10% of their depositors will come in and demand their money at any one time. This in turn means they can safely lend out at least $900 of the new $1,000 demand deposit. Suppose they do lend out this money, and the borrower from Bank 1 in turn deposits the money in Bank 2. If Bank 2 also has a 10% reserve requirement, it can lend out additional funds, $810 to be precise. And so it will continue until the original $1,000 actually creates much more money in what is called the multiple expansion of money. As to exactly how much money the initial $1,000 deposit will create, that's where a concept called the money multiplier comes in. The money multiplier is simply 1 divided by the bank's required reserve ratio. So in the example above, if the reserve requirement is 0.10 or 10%, then the money multiplier is 10, and 10 times the original $1,000 increase in demand deposits is $10,000. Now you try it. Suppose the reserve requirement is instead 50%. What's the money multiplier? That's right. It's 2, 1 divided by 0.50. So if Bank 1 receives a new demand deposit of $1,000, it can lend out $500 more. Bank 2 can lend out $250, and so on, until a total of $2,000 of new money is in circulation. Note, then, that the bigger the reserve requirement, the smaller the money multiplier, and the less money that is created by a new dollar of demand deposits. That should be a very intuitive result for you. Now, if you have been listening closely, there is probably something bothering you. You might want to know where in our example the $1,000 of paper money that was deposited in Bank 1 originally came from. In America, the answer is the Federal Reserve, the nation's central bank. Through its control of bank reserves, the Federal Reserve sets the level of short-term interest rates and has a major impact on output and employment. The Fed, as it is called, was created in 1913 following the financial panic of 1907. 
During this panic, numerous banks collapsed because of so-called runs on the banks. A bank run occurs when too many of the bank's depositors demand their money at the same time. To see the serious problem a bank run creates, imagine what would have happened to our goldsmith in the example above if everybody had showed up all at once demanding their $2,000 in gold and the goldsmith had only $1,000 of gold in his vault. Such bank runs usually happen because, for one reason or another, people suddenly believe that they may not be able to get all of their money out of their bank. The irony, of course, is that when everybody tries to do that at once, the fear becomes reality. In effect, a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that's where a central bank comes in. It can serve as the lender of last resort, so that if a bank needs money to pay off its depositors, it can always borrow it from the Fed, which is, in essence, a banker's bank. Now, from a global perspective, the U.S. Federal Reserve is a somewhat peculiar central bank in at least one sense. Rather than being one big bank directly controlled by the federal government, like in Europe or Japan, the Fed is both very decentralized and privately owned. It consists of 12 regional banks spread throughout the country, and they are owned by the commercial banks. While legally these 12 regional banks are private, in reality the Fed as a whole behaves as an independent government agency. Its board of governors consists of seven members nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate to serve overlapping terms of 14 years. And members of the board are generally bankers or economists. The key policy-making body at the Federal Reserve is the Federal Open Market Committee. This committee consists of 12 people, the seven members of the Fed's Board of Governors, plus the president of the New York Federal Reserve District Bank, plus four rotating members from the other 11 Federal Reserve District Banks. At the pinnacle of the system is the chairman of the Board of Governors. Often called the second most powerful individual in America, he acts as public spokesperson for the Fed and exercises enormous power over monetary policy. Besides issuing currency and being the lender of last resort, the Fed has four other functions, including regulating our financial institutions, providing banking services to the federal government, providing financial services to the nation's banks, and, most importantly, conducting monetary policy. The Fed manages monetary policy through its Federal Open Market Committee. This Open Market Committee meets periodically to discuss monetary policy, and it conducts such monetary policy through the use of three major policy instruments. The first and least used of these instruments is setting the reserve ratio or that reserve requirement. As we've learned from our discussion of the money multiplier, the Fed can increase the money supply by lowering the reserve requirement or decrease the money supply by raising the reserve requirement. As a practical matter, however, the Fed rarely uses changes in the reserve requirement to conduct monetary policy. The primary function of the requirement is to ensure that banks don't fall below a safe level of reserves and thereby undermine the stability of the system. The second instrument of monetary policy is the so-called discount rate. The discount rate is the interest rate that the Fed charges banks when they borrow money from the Fed. Lowering the rate makes it cheaper for banks to borrow money and expand the money supply. In contrast, raising the discount rate makes it more expensive for banks to borrow from the Fed and is contractionary. The third and by far the most important instrument of monetary policy is open market operations. Open market operations involve the buying and selling of government securities to expand or contract the money supply. In a nutshell, the Fed buys government securities when it wants to expand the money supply, and it sells government securities when it wants to contract the money supply. To see how this works, consider this example. Suppose the Fed thinks the economic winds are blowing up a little too much inflation. At its next open market committee meeting, the committee might vote then to sell $1 billion of Treasury bills from the Fed's portfolio to tighten money. Now, to whom are the bonds sold? Well, to the open market, which includes dealers and government bonds, who then resell them to commercial banks, big corporations, 
other financial institutions, and individuals. Now, here's the important point. The purchasers usually buy bonds by writing checks to the Fed that are drawn from an account in a commercial bank. For example, if the Fed sells $10,000 worth of bonds to Linda Smith, she writes a check on the Coyote Bank of Santa Fe. The Fed then presents this check at the Coyote Bank. Once the Fed is paid, this removes $10,000 of reserves, which would otherwise be available to loan out. From this example, you can see how open market operations might be used to close either a recessionary or an inflationary gap. This is illustrated with the help of the so-called monetary transmission mechanism. Here's how this mechanism works in this example to slow the economy down and cool inflationary pressures. To start off, the Fed reduces reserves through open market operations by selling some of its bonds. This causes the money supply to contract, and this in turn causes interest rates to rise. In the next step, the rise in interest rates reduces the level of investment. This interest rate hike also reduces consumption expenditures. For example, consumers might respond to higher mortgage interest rates by buying a smaller home or renovating their old home rather than purchasing a new one. The total effect of a fall in consumption and investment is to push aggregate expenditures or aggregate demand down. In doing so, real gross domestic product and inflation likewise go down, thereby achieving the desired policy goal of cooling the economy and the inflationary pressures. Of course, just the opposite approach can be taken by the Fed if it wants to stimulate the economy to close a recessionary gap. That is, it buys bonds. This increases the money supply and lowers interest rates. This in turn stimulates both consumption and investment, and off the economy goes. Now, there is at least one more important point to note about using open market operations to close recessionary and inflationary gaps. From a purely mechanistic Keynesian point of view, monetary policy is conducted with less precision than fiscal policy. To see this, recall from our last lecture, Lecture 3, on the Keynesian multiplier model, that if we knew the size of a recessionary gap and the value of the multiplier, we could calculate exactly how much we would have to increase government expenditures or cut taxes to close that gap. In the case of monetary policy, however, it is a bit more of a guessing game because the link between the money supply and shifts in the aggregate expenditure curve is much more complex. Relying on changes in the interest rate and the response of investment, consumption, and maybe even net exports. This observation leads to the major paradox of the Keynesian monetarist debate. Namely, that it is the Keynesian economists, not the monetarists, who support an activist role for monetary policy in fighting recessions and inflation. In defining an activist role for monetary policy, Keynesians believe that monetary policy is most effective as a fine-tuning policy instrument when the economy is at or near full employment, either in a mild recession or in a mild inflation. In this narrow band of output, Keynesians believe that investment and aggregate expenditures will respond relatively swiftly to changes in the interest rate which are brought about by changes in the money supply. This is particularly true when there is an inflationary gap in the economy. In such a case, Keynesians see the use of contractionary monetary policy as pulling on a string. However, Keynesians also believe that in a severe recession or depression, monetary policy is largely ineffective, equivalent to pushing on a string. That is, in a severe economic downturn, Keynesians believe that an increase in the money supply may well lead to a reduction in interest rates. However, these lower rates will have little or no success in encouraging additional investment and shifting the aggregate expenditures curve upward. Thus, in the recessionary and depressionary ranges of the economy, Keynesians believe that expansionary fiscal policy is much more appropriate. In contrast, the monetarist school doesn't believe in an activist fiscal and monetary policy at all. According to the father of monetarism, Milton Friedman, the problems of both inflation and recession may be traced to one thing, the rate of growth of the money supply. 
Inflation happens when the government prints too much money, and recessions happen when it prints too little. In fact, Milton Friedman totally rejects the Keynesian view of the origins of the Great Depression, as well as the Keynesian fiscal policy cure. Instead, Friedman blames the nation's economic collapse in 1929 on bad monetary policy by the Federal Reserve, rather than any inherent Keynesian instability with the system. As Milton Friedman has argued, the Federal Reserve contracted the money supply, plunging a private economy that would otherwise have been pretty stable into a depression. In fact, there is much truth in Friedman's argument. In the wake of numerous bank failures immediately preceding and then following the 1929 stock market crash, people began hoarding cash rather than leaving it in banks. At the same time, the banks themselves dramatically increased their reserves in case nervous depositors triggered a bank run. This fall in demand deposits, coupled with an increase in the bank's own self-imposed reserve requirements, led to a sharp contraction of the money supply. And Friedman faults the Federal Reserve for not stepping into the monetary policy breach to stabilize the system. Moreover, to Friedman, if the Fed had acted promptly and injected enough currency to stabilize the money supply, an activist fiscal policy, as embodied in Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal, would never have been necessary. More broadly, monetarists like Friedman liken the Federal Reserve to a bad driver, constantly either accelerating too fast or braking too hard on the money supply. This analogy describes quite well the behavior of the Federal Reserve during the 1970s as it tried to cope alternatively with recession and inflation and then both at the same time. As the Keynesian successes in the 1960s gave way to a soaring inflation in the early 1970s, the Federal Reserve did indeed stomp on the monetary brakes and watched as interest rates climbed dramatically. Predictably, investment slowed and the economy plunged into a recession until 1975 when the government stomped back on the accelerator using a Keynesian-style tax cut to stimulate the economy. To accommodate this tax cut, the Federal Reserve reluctantly increased the money supply and then stood by as a new and ugly macroeconomic phenomenon called stagflation, simultaneous high unemployment and high inflation, began to tighten its deadly grip on the nation. Interestingly, prior to the 1970s, economists did not believe you could even have both high inflation and high employment at the same time. If one went up, the other had to go down. But the 1970s proved economists wrong on this point and likewise exposed Keynesian economics as being incapable of solving the new stagflation problem. Do you see the Keynesian dilemma? Put another way, how would you use Keynesian fiscal policy to fight stagflation? The Keynesian dilemma was simply this. Using expansionary policies to reduce unemployment simply created more inflation, while using contractionary policies to curb inflation only deepened the recession. That meant that the traditional Keynesian tools could solve only half of the stagflation problem at any one time and only by making the other half worse. It was this inability of Keynesian economics to cope with stagflation that set the stage for Professor Milton Friedman's monitorous challenge to what had been the Keynesian orthodoxy. To fight stagflation and to more broadly prevent the roller coaster ride of economic booms and busts, the monitorous solution is to set monetary targets and stick with them. For example, if you want economic growth to proceed at an annual rate of 3%, then you should simply increase the money supply by 3%. This monetary targets approach was precisely the policy prescription embraced by the Fed in 1979 after almost a decade of fruitless battling against stagflation. In October of that year, Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker announced that the Fed would no longer focus on holding interest rates stable. Instead, it would simply adopt monetary growth targets and stick by them. Unfortunately, the Fed's monetarist cure proved to be almost as bad as the stagflation disease. 
Interest rates soared to above 20%. Inflation remained in the double digits. And the economy entered into the beginning of a severe three-year recession. While Chairman Volcker stuck to his monitorous guns and watched as both tight money and a deep recession eventually helped wring inflation out of the economy, the cost in human terms was high. Finally, in the summer of 1982, the Fed relaxed its monetarist rules, and by late fall, the recession had ended. Just in time to try the latest evolution in economic theory, supply-side economics. In the next lecture, we'll talk a lot more about stagflation and inflation and the problems of unemployment. In the meantime, please try to complete the exercises in your course guide. I'm Peter Navarro from the University of California, Irvine. After listening to Lecture 4, a student posed this question to Professor Navarro. Some people say that war is always good for the economy. But in your lecture, it seems like the Vietnam War caused a lot of economic problems. How have the several wars in Iraq affected the economy? Let's listen to the professor's response. The idea that war is good for the economy dates back to what happened in World War II. That, in fact, was a great stimulus for the United States and global economy. It basically bootstrapped the world into a much higher rate of growth. But generally, wars tend to create more problems than they solve. The problem with the Vietnam War, basically, was the refusal of the president to trade off guns for butter. We got this incredible demand pull inflation, and that carried into the 1970s, and it, it created a very, very bad decade. So after the boom, we got a pretty big bust. This, uh, these modern wars, uh, going back to the Gulf War in Iraq in, in 1990, and then again now, uh, at the turn of this, this next century, the second war we've had in Iraq. Um, this likewise has created a similar kind of problem uh, that Lyndon Johnson had in the 1960s because uh, the United States has been funding this war but has not cut back on social spending uh, so that we're getting more inflation. we got these large budget deficits that, that the U.S. has carried. And uh, it remains to be seen how this will turn out. But this has not been a good stimulus for the economy. It's likely to create more inflation uh, and area problems than anything. Another student then asked, how have the Internet and credit cards affected the money and banking system? And do these new technologies make it harder or easier for the Federal Reserve to conduct monetary policy? Now, that's a great question. In fact, what the Internet and transactions and credit cards do is they increase the so-called velocity of money. So essentially, for any given amount of money we have out there, uh, it turns over faster, and that, in effect, creates a bigger supply of money. And it's been hard for the Federal Reserve over time as technology has changed to kind of keep track and offset that. So I would say that the new technology makes it harder for the Federal Reserve in that sense. Uh, but on the other hand, as we move to what at some point is going to be a, a currency-less economy uh, that runs on pure credit cards, um, it, it'll fight a, a bigger problem that we're facing, which is counterfeiting. Finally, one student wondered, has the U.S. Federal Reserve typically done a good job? This is a matter of, of some dispute. A lot of people think that Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan, particularly uh, between the 1980s and the turn of the, uh, the new century here, uh, has done a great job. Uh, and they never question him. But on the other hand, some economists firmly believe that Greenspan actually caused the 2001 recession by raising interest rates too far too fast in the presence of what he thought was significant inflationary pressures, which turned out not to have existed. And uh, other economists also believe that in, uh, in 2004 and 2005, uh, Greenspan essentially repeated the same mistake and uh, destabilized what was a strong economic recovery. So the jury is kind of still out. That The Milton Friedman point of view is that the Federal Reserve is, in general, much too activist. Uh, but we also know that setting monetary growth targets, while it sounds simple, uh, isn't quite as simple as one would have you believe. Bottom line, this is uh, difficult stuff, and I'm glad you're studying it. Decades of Keynesian triumphs, monetary policy played an important supporting role.
particularly in the 1950s, the Eisenhower administration relied heavily on a tight monetary policy to keep inflation in check. In fact, many critics now believe that an overly conservative monetary policy led to a stagnating economy in the late 1950s and set up the defeat of Eisenhower's would-be successor, Republican Richard Nixon, in the 1960 presidential election. Nixon, of course, lost to Democrat and Keynesian disciple John F. Kennedy, who ran on the slogan of getting the country moving again. Moving again was exactly what the Democratic administrations of first John F. Kennedy and then Lyndon Johnson did to the economy. In fact, by the end of the 1960s, the economy... In this lecture, we're going to focus on monetary policy and the banking system. Monetary policy involves the use of changes in the money supply to contract or expand the economy. Between the Great Depression and the height of the Vietnam War, monetary policy largely played second fiddle to fiscal policy, and perhaps rightly so. After all, fiscal policy had been a resounding success in lifting us out of the Great Depression in the 1930s, as well as ending a more mild but nonetheless significant recession in 1949 and 1950. Moreover, the astonishing success of the Kennedy tax cut of 1964 seemed to provide incontrovertible proof that Keynesian economics could be used to fine-tune the economy and keep it at or close to full employment with minimal inflation. Nonetheless, even during these four decades, second, money serves as a unit of account or standard of value. It tells us the rates at which goods can be exchanged. For example, if a loaf of bread costs a dollar and a pound of butter costs two dollars, the butter will exchange for two loaves of bread. Third, money serves as a store of value. This is because people can hold on to money this year and then spend it next year. However, it is this function that money performs least well. This is because most methods of holding money do not yield the same kind of monetary returns that you could get by storing wealth in the form of other less liquid assets such as stocks and bonds. Thus, in the presence of inflation, money can rapidly lose its value. Now, when we examine, like gold nuggets and silver coins, represents the preferred money of centuries past. Today, however, in virtually all countries, commodity money has been replaced by two other kinds of money, bank money and paper or fiat money. An example of bank money is the checkbook that you use to pay your bills. So-called fiat money, or paper money, is simply the dollar bills in America, the euros in Europe, and the yen in Japan. An important observation to make about money is that it is the most liquid of assets, meaning that it is the most readily spendable. In fact, money has three major functions. First, money is a medium of exchange. Without money, we would have to conduct our transactions by barter, which involves the direct exchange of one good or service for another. It was moving so fast that inflation began to rear its ugly head. By 1969, inflation had crept to over 5%, high for those good old days, and by the early 1970s, it had jumped to almost double digits. It was at this point, as a new phenomenon known as stagflation began to emerge, that monetarism began to challenge the Keynesian orthodoxy. But we're getting ahead of our story. Let's go back to some basics, and let's start by defining money. So what is money? That's easy to answer, you might say. It's that cash in our pockets. But money actually has a much broader definition. It is anything that can be widely used and accepted in exchange for other goods and services. And in practice, there are three kinds of money. Commodity money 